We the people of Almighty God, known biblically by His memorial name Yahweh, the one and only Sovereign over all creation, humbly submit ourselves as individuals, families, churches, and communities to His rule as judge, lawgiver, and king. We furthermore acknowledge Jesus Christ's supremacy as King of Kings and Lord of Lords over ourselves and all nations. We recognize the Holy Spirit as our guide unto all truth, because all power and authority reside with Him. We acknowledge that liberty, justice, domestic tranquility, and general welfare for ourselves and our posterity could only be achieved as communities by His perfect law and righteous judgments. We hereby freely covenant together as his humble servants, bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, into a civil body politic for the express purpose of establishing a government of, by, and for him. This is to be accomplished by implementing his commandments, statutes, and judgments as the only standard for ordering our lives, both individually and communally. We furthermore look to him for wisdom assistance and protection in conducting his affairs here on earth as it is in heaven. Article 1. All executive authority resides in Almighty God and is, therefore, vested in Almighty God by Almighty God. Isaiah 33:22 declares, Yahweh is king. He has never abdicated his throne. He is as much king now as he was at creation and at the time Isaiah affirmed his sovereignty. As perpetual king, the kingdom he rules over is also perpetual. When in 1 Samuel 8, the Israelites sought an earthly king, Yahweh gave them the desires of their hearts. Nevertheless, they were punished for seeking a covering other than His, and paid a dear price for their lack of faith in and fidelity to Him. We therefore do not seek an earthly king, a president or a monarch, to reside over kingdom affairs. In the tradition of our 17th century Christian American forebears, we commit ourselves to Yahweh alone as our sovereign. Article 2, Section 1. All legislative authority resides in Almighty God and is, therefore, vested in Almighty God by Almighty God. Isaiah 33.22 and James 4.12 declare Yahweh is the exclusive legislator there are no others. Anyone who claims the title of legislator, particularly when his laws, whether commandments, statutes, or judgments, are in consonant with Yahweh's, is a usurper and is perpetuating the same anarchy initiated by Adam and Eve. Anarchy is a state of society without government or law. Because all legitimate law originates with Yahweh, any legislation not in accord with his amounts to an act of treason against God Almighty and, therefore, His kingdom. Yahweh is the only lawgiver because as Creator and Sovereign, He is the only one with the authority to determine what is good and what is evil. This is true, not because we recognize it as such, but because it is His innate right as the only ever-living I am that I am. Because there is only one true God, there is only one standard for morality. As the source of morality, Yahweh is the author of all true law and, therefore, holds the monopoly on legislation. Because legislation enacts morality, morality and legislation are indivisible. Any legislation antithetical to Yahweh is tantamount to calling good evil and evil good. 
It amounts to a usurpation of his divine jurisdiction. When man rejects Yahweh's standard of morality, he invariably makes legal what God has made unlawful and illegal what he has made lawful, making a mockery of his authority. Case in point, any government that does not recognize Yahweh's exclusive legislative authority. His triune moral law cannot be improved upon because it is perfect. It is unlawful for man to amend or repeal it in whole or in part. Because Yahweh's moral law is perfect, any endeavor to improve upon it is an attempt to dethrone Yahweh and commandeer his throne. Section 2. Because it is impossible for man to make law, he is either a usurper or merely an administrator of Yahweh's law. Administrators, not to be confused with judges, are law finders, not law makers. An administrator's responsibility is to assist in implementing Yahweh's law, his government, here on earth at all levels of society, individually, domestically, and civilly. Every Christian man should be an administrator of Yahweh's law on at least the first two levels. Administrators represent Yahweh, not the people or any one person. It is their duty to search out the law of Yahweh as it applies to any particular situation, and then to teach and implement the laws appropriate to that situation or need. This does not mean supplementary stipulations cannot be implemented, provided they are consonant with Yahweh's prescribed law. For example, a father who governs his family under God's authority and by his law has the liberty to implement house rules, such as hygienic and household chores. The same is true on all other levels of society. Today's technology did not exist when Moses codified Yahweh's moral laws. Therefore, additional stipulations are required for these new conditions under and in accord with God's case laws, his statutes and judgments. Provided such regulations do not conflict with Yahweh's moral law, they are perfectly acceptable. Biblical precedents are found in Nehemiah's lots, Jeremiah's land deeds, Rahab's patriarchal requisites, and Mordecai's Purim celebration, none of which are directly provided for in the commandments or statutes. Section 3. Civil administrators shall be composed of biblically qualified men, 30 years to 50 years of age, who will remain such so long as they aspire to the position, and provided they remain biblically qualified. Civil administrators are to be nominated by men from their immediate community who can personally attest to the nominee's biblical qualifications. When there are more candidates than positions, nominees shall be elected by Yahweh via casting lots. The number of administrators shall be determined by each and every local community, as their needs require. Communities might be well advised to consult the numerical model for judges in Exodus 18 as a guide for administrators as well, that is, one administrator for every ten families. Civil administrators, like judges, are to be compensated for the time and services from tithes and free will offerings. Section 4. If at any point during his tenure a civil administrator becomes biblically unqualified, it is then incumbent upon the men of his community to remove him from office and have him prosecuted if his offense so dictates, lest the community become complicit in any misuse of his position as administrator. Article 3, Section 1 All judicial authority resides in Almighty God 
and is therefore vested in Almighty God by Almighty God. Isaiah 33.22 declares Yahweh is King, Lawgiver, and Judge. His sovereignty is inherent in and over all three branches of government. Consequently, any civil judgment not congruent with His perfect law and altogether righteous judgments amounts to judicial usurpation and, as such, an act of sedition against Yahweh's sovereignty. Section 2 All viable dynamic law consists of three integral components commandments, statutes, and judgments. The commandments express the primal, foundational law. The statutes expound upon the commandments. And the judgments enforce the commandments and their respective statutes. Without any one of these three components, the law is crippled. A commandment or statute without a judgment becomes merely good advice. Whoever defines criminal behavior and dispenses judgments holds dominion in society. Yahweh intends for the judgments to be in the hands of His people. Section 3 Yahweh's judicial order is a graduated system, a magistrate appellate system rather than a litigant appellate system. Difficult cases in lower courts are to be turned over to higher judges over fifties, hundreds, and thousands for adjudication. Yahweh's morality, as expressed in His triune law, is infallible and therefore immutable. His standard is inalterable and therefore does not change over time or with newly appointed judges. Therefore, except in cases where a higher court discerns a demonstrable error in decision or judgment, a lower court's decision or judgment cannot be overturned by a higher court. Intervention by a higher court, unless requested by a lower court, is otherwise not allowed. After a verdict has been rendered, compelling new evidence can be cause for a reversal or a new trial. Because delayed judgment diminishes the deterrent effect, all judgments are to be carried out expeditiously. Section 4. There is nothing in the Bible that resembles a jury system drawn from the general population. Even with jury nullification, a juror's right to judge a law as unjust, oppressive, or inapplicable to any particular case, in force, juries invariably render decisions based upon each jury's collective standard of morality or immorality. Juries are notoriously fickle and produce, at best, erratic justice. Without Yahweh's law as the standard, jury decisions are based upon the capricious morality of its members and are just as likely, perhaps even more so, to render bad decisions as they are good decisions. Most people lack the independence and resolution to resist the will of a majority or the presiding judge. Juries drawn from the general population put juridical determinations in the hands of an unpredictable and unequally yoked public, the majority of whom are likely to be non-Christian. Juries drawn from the general population are unlikely to be astute in Yahweh's law and therefore no more apt to render justice than a corrupt judge. Moreover, unlike a corrupt judge who can be removed from his bench, there is no recourse for inept juries. Section 5. The Bible provides for judges, officers, and magistrates. Judges shall be composed of biblically qualified men who will remain in office as long as they aspire to the position, are mentally capable, and remain biblically qualified. Judges must rule in the fear of Yahweh and on his behalf instead of the state or any one race, class, gender, or person. This can only be accomplished when judges' rulings are based exclusively upon Yahweh's never-changing morality as reflected in his commandments, statutes, and judgments. At the same time, judges must be impartial in their decisions, regardless race, 
class, gender, or person. Section 6. Judges are to be nominated by men from their immediate community who can personally attest to the nominee's biblical qualifications. When there are more candidates than positions, nominees shall be elected by Yahweh be casting lots. The number of judges per local community shall be determined by the numeration provided in Exodus 18, with one lower judge for every ten families. Speedy trials should prevail. Judges are to be compensated for their time and services from tithes and free will offerings. Section 7. If during his tenure a judge becomes biblically unqualified, the men of his community must remove him from his bench and have him prosecuted if his offense so dictates, lest the community become complicit in any misuse of his position as judge. If a judge knowingly rules on behalf of a criminal, as the result of being bribed or for any other reason, he is to be impeached and then punished with the same judgment the guilty party would otherwise have incurred. Section 8. Depending upon the nature of the crime, Yahweh's civil laws call for five principal modes of punishment. 1. The death penalty. 2. Retribution. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, etc., with penalties. 3. Restitution, with penalties. 4. Indentured servitude. 5. Floggings. Except for short-term pre-trial incarcerations, prisons, which are a tax burden upon law-abiding citizens, are superfluous. Bail is likewise redundant. It is also unbiblical. The absence of prisons necessitates speedy trials and expeditious punishment. Testimony is required of all witnesses, including the accused and his relatives. In addition to the required restitution, two to five times, depending upon the nature of the crime, anyone discovered attempting to cover up his crime must pay an additional 20% to his victim. Except for two instances, Yahweh's law does not provide for fines to be paid to the state or government. In all other instances, monetary remuneration in the form of fines or penalties is to be paid to the injured party or the relatives of the deceased. No one is liable unless injury or damage has occurred to another person or his property. The state cannot be a damaged party. Consequently, there is no liability for such things as speeding or other victimless crimes. In instances where death, injury, or damaged property results from reckless negligence, speeding, etc., liability will be assessed according to Yahweh's prescribed judgments. The designation minor is a man-made exception. Judgments are to be meted out the same regardless of age or sex of the offender. Following conviction, anyone, regardless of age, sex, or mental capacity, found guilty of premeditated murder must be put to death. For cases other than premeditated murder, including cases requiring an eye for an eye, etc., monetary indemnity is allowable at the discretion of the victim's next of kin. Section 9. Stoning is the principal means for execution for the following reasons. 1. Because of its potent deterrent effect. 2. Because it provides the means for the next of kin blood avenger, witnesses, and the community to participate in the execution. The harsher the punishment, the greater the deterrent, 
People are less likely to commit felonies when the maximum penalty is mandatory for unrepentant criminals. This is especially true if it is compulsory for the entire community to attend and participate in public executions. When stones are not accessible, firing squads, which also allows for community participation, may be used in substitution for stoning. Section 10. Because Yahweh is sovereign over his law and order, and because judges represent him, contempt of court, refusal to comply with a judge's biblical verdict or order, is contempt of God and his law. Contempt of court is, therefore, a capital crime. Because contempt of court is a capital crime, non-compliance in non-capital cases will be virtually unheard of. Section 11. The following six safeguards are to be implemented in all cases. They should all but eliminate false testimony and protect the integrity of the court and its decisions. 1. Defendants are to be given the opportunity to defend themselves against their accusers. 2. Litigants are required to take self-maledictory oaths by which they call Yahweh to curse them if their testimony is false. In some cases, perjury can be considered a third commandment infraction and, as such, incur the death penalty. 3. Witnesses, or anyone with pertinent information to a crime, are required to testify regardless whether they are married or related to a litigant. 4. Convictions require two or more witnesses. Five. Witnesses are required to participate in the execution or flogging of those whom they help convict. 6. False witnesses are to suffer the same punishment they intend for their victims. Section 12. Trials are to be open to the public in easy accessible locations. Public trials place judges under the jurisdiction and oversight of the community that nominated them. This helps curb temptation for judicial abuse. Executions, retributions, and floggings are likewise to be held in public view. The community, including sojourning strangers against which the crime was committed, is required to attend and participate in the execution or flogging of convicted criminals. Executions are a covenantal community responsibility. The Bible knows nothing of private executions or tax-paid professional executioners, both of which impersonalize crime and diminish the deterrent effect of the death penalty. Stone piles covering executed criminals are to be left intact in open sight in order to accentuate and perpetuate the deterrent effect. Section 13. Lex Talionis or the law of retribution, an eye for an eye, a, a tooth for a tooth, etc., mandates equitable retribution and restricts the extent of retaliation in order to keep the punishment proportional to the crime. Lex talionis is especially important for its potent deterrent effect upon non-capital criminals. The inherent liabilities in the an eye for an eye judgment promotes personal responsibility for one's actions which, in turn, eliminates the need for insurance companies and encroaching government agencies such as OSHA and the FDA. Lex Talionis also substantially reduces both premeditated crime and careless disregard for the lives and property of others. Monetary remuneration may be substituted for Lex Talionis. The amount is to be determined by the victim or next of kin. Retribution is required only if the victim demands it, not the state. In addition to an eye for an eye, the perpetrator of an injury upon another person is also liable for any medical expenses and or loss of income incurred as a consequence of intentional harm or reckless negligence. This stipulation is not to include remuneration for any supposed or real pain, suffering, embarrassment, or indignity 
suffered at the hands of someone else. Shoot. 